OT1 is a solo audited level, but really is hardly much of anything in terms of content, with no earth-shaking revelations or new information imparted. Instead, the person simply solo audits some common lower-level procedures to get the hang of solo auditing. The end result, according to the newest Scientology grade chart, is the ability to handle OT phenomena in relation to others and confidence as a solo auditor. OT2 is a complicated level that deals mainly with the idea of dichotomies, opposing ideas which Hubbard claimed had been implanted in people's minds over the millennia of their spiritual existence, and which made people into slaves and robots. These implants are kind of complex, but basically involved overwhelming the Thetan with electronics so strong that Hubbard said they hadn't even been invented here on Earth yet. Various commands or ideas would be installed during these implants to change the thinking and behavior of the Thetan, and by installing opposing ideas, they set up a kind of insanity. These dichotomies are things like, he must survive, he mustn't survive, or I should exist, I shouldn't exist, or to die is to live, to live is to die. Hubbard listed out hundreds of these dichotomies in the materials of OT2. In Scientology, the sum total of everything that has happened to a person as a spiritual being is called the whole track. The end result of all these implants on the whole track is to put us all into a kind of spiritual hypnotic daze, where each life we lead is based on some cookie-cutter pattern. Get a job, get married, have a dog, have a cat, have kids, drive a car, go to work, grow old and die, rinse and repeat. Hubbard said that Thetans had been implanted with these different ideas thousands of times, so they wouldn't want anything else but this humdrum, boring existence and would stay out of trouble. By following the solo auditing procedures of OT2, a person addresses and erases these dichotomies, so they no longer affect their behavior or block their whole track memories. So the end result is the ability to confront the whole track. Then there is OT3, also called the Wall of Fire, which contains the infamous Xenu narrative, as laid out on South Park back in 2005 and discussed on almost every talk show and expose ever put out on Scientology since. I won't go into all the details of the whole story here, but here is the handwritten account that people who do OT3 read. The head of the Galactic Federation, 76 planets around larger stars visible from here, founded 95 million years ago, very space opera, solved overpopulation, 250 billion or so per planet, 178 billion on average, by mass implanting. He caused people to be brought to Tegiak, Earth, and put an H-bomb on the principal volcanoes, incident two. And then the Pacific area ones were taken in boxes to Hawaii and the Atlantic area ones to Las Palmas and there packaged. His name was Xenu. He used renegades. Various misleading data by means of circuits, etc. was placed in the implants. When through with his crime, loyal officers to the people captured him after six years of battle and put him in an electronic mountain trap where he still is. They are gone. The place, Confederation, has since been a desert. The story is interesting science fiction, but the idea that any of it is literally true is ridiculous, since almost every aspect of it is so easy to debunk. But instead of going into all that, which is not the purpose of this video, instead, I want to say that I believe the importance of Xenu has been grossly blown out of proportion. Yes, that whole crazy story is part of OT3, and it's a big part. But the real meat of OT3 for Scientologists is not finding out about Xenu, it's the consequences of what happened as a result of Xenu's genocidal actions. What people also don't generally talk about is that the Xenu story, also called Incident 2, is only part of OT3. There's also Incident 1. Incident 1 is the earliest incident Hubbard ever wrote about. It occurred four quadrillion years ago, and is something every single Thetan in this universe has in common. This handwritten page is the only description of it. Occurs at start of track. Loud snap. Waves of light. Chariot comes out, turns right and left. Cherub comes out. Blows horn. 
comes close. Shattering series of snaps. Cherub fades back, retreats. Blackness dumped on Phaeton. While this reads more like someone's LSD trip, Hubbard assigned a lot of importance to this beginning of life in the physical universe. He said that Xenu took advantage of a phenomena called clustering, but that Incident 1 is actually the basis of why Phaetons cluster in the first place. So what is clustering? Well, this is where things get really weird. You see, Hubbard said that Phaetons are peculiar in that they sometimes can become subordinate to one another and stick together in clumps. When a Phaeton is stuck to another Phaeton or a body, but isn't the one in control, it's called a body Phaeton or BT. He said that a cluster is a group of body Phaetons crushed or held together by some mutual bad experience. Why would this happen? Well, you may be amused or disgusted or just plain confused by this explanation from Hubbard, but here's what he said. I've isolated a way a Thetan comes to be stuck to another Thetan. This gives the basis of clusters and having BTs. The cycle is this. A Thetan collides with another. That one makes a picture of being collided with. Other BTs get stuck to the picture. The moment of actual contact of Thetans was brief, but the picture, containing a stop or withdrawal, tends to be permanent. Thetans then get the idea they can be permanently stuck as they see pictures of it happening. Thus we get the concept of a black Theta body. This would be actual BTs stuck to a Thetan plus pictures of BTs stuck to a Thetan. In the OT3 materials, after Hubbard wrote about Xenu, he wrote the important part. One's body is a mass of individual Thetans stuck to oneself or to the body. One has to clean them off by running Incident 1, then Incident 2. It's a long job requiring care, patience, and good auditing. You are running beings. They respond like any preclear, some large, some small. Thetans believed they were one. This is the primary error. Good luck. It is this mass of body Thetans which Scientologists believe they are addressing and liberating from a kind of spiritual captivity, which gives Scientologists the idea that they are literally saving lives and creating a new world. It being the case that only about 5% of all Scientologists have ever made it this far, the vast majority of them have no idea what anyone is talking about when Xenu, aliens, or space cooties are brought up and honestly refute these ideas as ridiculous and not part of Scientology. That's why it might be fun to ridicule Scientologists by talking about how silly, silly the Xenu narrative is, but realize that unless you're talking to an OT, your criticism is lost on them, and you won't be doing a thing to change their heart or mind. The newly freed Thetans are no longer considered to have the status of body Thetan and are now free to set off on their own. Hubbard wrote about this in an issue of May 4th, 1968 called Character of Body Thetans, where he said, Body Thetans are just Thetans. When you get rid of one, he goes off and possibly squares around picks up a body, or admires daisies. He is, in fact, a sort of cleared being. He cannot fail to eventually, if not at once, regain many abilities. Many have been asleep for the last 75 million years. A body Thetan responds to any process any Thetan responds to. Although a human being is a composite being, there is only one I, that is you, who runs things. Body Thetans just hold one back. You will continue to be you. You, inside, can of course separate out Body Thetans, and so, solo auditing is the answer. Hubbard said that Body Thetans are the reason a person has random thoughts or ideas or attitudes that don't seem to make a lot of sense. Body Thetans think their own thoughts and have had their own experiences before clustering, and these old memories can confuse a person, mistaking those memories for their own. 
It's easy to see how this could contribute to insanity because those voices in your head are real and they're not always just your own imagination. They create trouble in auditing and in life with a kind of false memory syndrome. Hubbard also said that the entire OT3 incident is the reason for man's tendency to incite mob violence and war, as well as man's zealotry and religious ideation. By doing OT3, Scientologists believe they are literally eradicating the reason for war and a great deal of criminality and insanity. The goal of OT3 is to rid oneself of all their body thetans and thereby gain the return of their self-determinism. OT3 was released in 1967, and it wasn't for another 11 years until Hubbard came to realize that there were more issues with body thetans than he first imagined. The next step on the grade chart is OT4, the OT drug rundown. Hubbard claimed that drugs and toxins have been around for a very long time, and that there were even cultures earlier on the whole track that were much more drug-centric than ours. Hubbard didn't have a lot of good things to say about drugs, especially recreational ones, such as LSD, which he blamed for all kinds of cognitive problems. He came up with a pseudoscientific approach to detoxification, which he called the purification rundown, and he then came up with various auditing actions that would address times a person had taken drugs or alcohol or medicines and sought to find the earlier problems or upsets that had driven the person to the drugs in the first place. The Scientology drug rundown is the first of these, near the bottom of the bridge, and uses simple recall techniques to look mainly at this lifetime incidence of drug intake. At the point of New Era Dianetics, there's a step called the NED drug rundown, which takes a deeper dive into drug use and uses Dianetics auditing to relive the moments of pain and unconsciousness connected with drug use, and which goes back down the whole track as far as necessary to get rid of their harmful mental effects. Then there is OT4, the OT drug rundown. This is done by an auditor, not solo. Here's what Hubbard said about this. BTs and clusters are affected by drugs. They mock up, recreate, the biochemistry, and they mock up the drug and drug incidents. Drug taking in this lifetime re-stimulates earlier incidents of drug taking on the track. When the case is viewed as a composite of BTs and clusters, you will see that drug taking in this lifetime causes a highly multiple re-stim. A drug incident can be a cluster-making incident. Earlier drug cultures on the track were much worse than this drug culture. In some cultures, the psychiatrist, priest, and medico were all one and the same person and frequently used drugs. Some implanters used drugs, either as part of the implant incident or to keep a population enslaved thereafter. When BTs and clusters who have whole track drug incidents are re-stimulated by a this lifetime drug incident, there is a multiple re-stim, and if severe enough, can form a new cluster composed of the BTs and clusters thrown into re-stimulation by the drug. So it is that one finds out that there are more BTs to deal with, the ones who weren't found on OT3 because they were too dead or unconscious to be dealt with because of that past drug use. The end result of OT4 is freedom from the mental and spiritual effects that drugs, medicine, and alcohol can have on a being.